Hey, well, I'd like to thank uh, Leader Proctor and Owen for um, inviting me here, and, and uh, I'm, I'm very glad to be in the basic biology session. Um, because I'm going to be telling you some basic biology. I was actually hoping that David Relman would talk a bit more about babies. Um, we should have maybe coordinated on that because I sort of expected him to. So I'll, I'll touch on microbiome colonization and assembly in babies, but then move on to a few other aspects of basic biology um, that we've been working on that I, I think um, you might find interesting. So there's this rapidly developing data coming out about what sort of environment we actually develop in when we're in the womb. I think we've uh, assumed for a long time that it's been sterile, uh, but, but studies that are in progress and coming out are indicating that it might be slightly more microbially sort of um, uh, influence than we might previously have thought. But it's, it's, it's still a, a relatively protected space um, where we develop until we come to the outside where we're then rapidly colonized by uh, the microbiota of the biosphere, which, of course, are, are very diverse and vast. And so uh, one of the first things that's, that, that happens, uh, even before you take your first breath, I think, is that you start to be colonized by microbes. And, you, and, and we need microbes for proper development. And this has come from years of, of research um, that goes back more than 100 years with nautobiotic animals animals that have been raised under germ-free conditions differ quite substantially from animals that are raised normally in a normal microbial world in that they have a different kind of immune system that's not fully developed, if you will, because that requires microbial influence. They have different physiologies. They have different behaviors. There's lists and lists and lists of ways in which animals that are raised under extremely artificial conditions without microbes can differ from um, animals that are raised um, under um, with, with the microbial influence. So we've done some work looking at how this colonization happens. Uh, this is a case study of a single individual over two and a half years, which um, is quite a long time for, for current studies, although more of these are, are coming now um, so, that, so that we can sort of compare the patterns that we saw in this particular individual. And um, what you're looking at is uh, bar graphs of uh, taxa. This is a very simple way of looking at the data. Each one of these bars represents a day over two and a half years, and there's certain events that associate with changes in the distribution of these taxa, such as a fever here, the introduction of table foods here, which brought about a bloom in Bacteroidetes. And all the while, there was a very slow increase over this time period in, in the diversity that was there. So the richness showed a very slow incline over time, increase over time. And then various events bring about these big changes in the, the relative abundances of different taxa. And the way this particular individual responded to these um, events is something, and here's a, an antibiotic event, for example, is something that we can characterize, but whether whether this, these responses are typical of all individuals uh, and, and whether these, we can start to, to go from these associations that we see in a case study to, to general principles is something that's going to require uh, following many, many babies. And this is something, for instance, that David Relvin's group has been doing. And so um, we, can, we can make some logical sense as to why things like Bacteroidetes increase when there's table foods introduced based on what we know about their genomes and how they have the genes necessary to, to break down these foods. And so changing the, the, the milieu here in the gut is definitely going to um, bring about a bloom in the kinds of organisms that can um, that, that use those substrates. Uh, but, but the kinds of microbes that are present in one individual to another um, is something that uh, we're still trying to understand where they come from, how much regional differences might affect the kinds of microbes we're colonized with. Um, food, yeah, we have some idea of how, how food influences these things, but there's still a, a lot of basic biology that, that still needs to, to be understood about this. Um, in this particular individual, breaking it down and, and, and looking at the kinds of sort of consortia, if you will, this is again the same bar graph showing you how the phyla change, but within those phyla we see discrete consortia that are members of those phyla, and we see them change very gradually over time. Uh, 
so these are the early days. We see this sort of group, and then later on this group, and later on this group. The, these early taxa came back after antibiotics. We can see that here, and then a whole new consortium replaced them afterwards. Um, and the, these, these, we know that these associations that we see like this, these groups are, are non-random. Uh, but again, it's going to take profiling many different types of babies over time, for instance, to, to understand how, um, if, if there's some general principles we can, we can uh, derive from these kinds of data, or, or, if, or if different perturbances are act differently um, in different individuals. Um, when we think about how the microbiota develop over an entire lifetime, this is something that we can only piece together from looking at uh, current studies of, of individuals that have these different ages, because at this time, there hasn't been a single individual that's been followed over the course of a lifetime like this. And so we, we have data on, on very young people, and we have data on adults. Most of the data is on adults, and then we have some data on elderly people. Uh, but, but again, no one person has been studied for this long. And so, although we, we can see um, some sort of general themes, like for instance, it looks like there is differences in very early colonization based on how babies are born, and it, it looks like stability sort of comes in maybe in early ch childhood, and, and, and adult microbiota may be even more stable than that. Um, these are all, uh, these principles are basically derived from stitching together very different studies on very different cohorts. And so going forward, I think it's going to be very important to have large, long-term cohorts so that we can really uh, test whether what we think is happening based on looking at current studies is actually holds up when you, when you look at people over the long term. And one of the questions that the people in sort of the probiotics industry and so on are particularly interested in is, is um, whether or not what happens early on affects uh, microbiome later in life, for instance. So if you have certain, certain microbiota early here, are they going to affect what comes later? Do we have distinct successional stages? And do, the, do the, what you have in these later stages depend on what comes before? And um, that's not something I think we have the answer to at this point. So what does impact the microbiome later in life or during adulthood in general? Um, this, this is a very fuzzy diagram. It was deliberately fuzzy uh, that Pete Turnbaugh and colleagues wrote um, back in 2007 asking what kinds of uh, influences are there on the microbiome, both what's shared and what's not shared between people. And you can think of this as lineage is present or the functional genes that are present. And you can come up with things that you, you know or think might influence this, like the lifestyle and the immune system and the environment. But the reason all these arrows are sort of the same size and don't intersect is because we don't have a good idea of which are the strongest, how they might interact, and so on. And one of the areas that we have the least understanding of at this time is host genotype. And I'm going to tell you now about a study that we've been doing to address how host genotype might influence the composition of the gut microbiota. So there's a need for genetic studies in humans. Uh, there have been some studies in mice using QTL mapping that reveal associations between certain taxa abundances, for instance, and certain loci in the genome. These loci can be quite big and contain sometimes hundreds of genes, and so actually getting in finer detail as to which genes are actually driving the associations um, can, is the sort of the next step for, for, the, for animal studies as well. Um, there's been studies with candidate genes in humans. So for instance, if you have a particular allele that's associated with a particular disease like NOD2 and Crohn's, you can select for people with different versions of that and look at microbiota, and that's one example. But you have to know what genes you're looking for to do this. Uh, but there haven't been any published studies yet on genome-wide associations in humans. There has been a, a work going back uh, more than a decade now looking at twins, and, and twins are particularly sort of intriguing. Uh, this is not actually a mirror. This is a human mirror. This is an improv group that got monozygotic twins and got them to line up down subway cars. 
just to see people's reactions. And so this really drives home the point that monozygotic twins are really remarkably similar phenotypically. And the question is, are they got microbiota is also more similar than, than you might expect for, say, fraternal twins, which might be these two, although they're not. And so again, this goes back. Uh, people have start, used twins. Uh, this is an example of a paper from 2001 using DGGE fingerprinting and based on the relatedness of the people where one was the monozygotic twins, they saw a trend towards more similar microbiotas in the monozygotic twins. And then Pete, again, when he was working in uh, Jeff Gordon's lab, uh, published this study. So these are unifrac distances. This is based on 16S RNA pyrosequencing. Uh, when the bar is smaller, it means the microbiotas are more similar. And so now you're looking at, at twin pairs, MZ versus DZ, and there was a hint of greater similarities for MZs, although probably because of the relatively low number of twins used here, it didn't actually come out as significant. So we've, we've decided to look at twins, and we're looking at twins that are genotyped, so we can, we can actually do a GWAS study as well as, a, as use some of the twin-based techniques to look at this. And we're working with... Um, Tim Spector, who runs the King's College of London uh, twin registry there. And it has about 15,000 twins in it that they've been working with for many years, and they're part of, sort of many genome-based uh, studies. So uh, in this particular study, we have access to about 6,000 genotype twins, and we're collecting st stool from as many as we can. So uh, basically, we're asking them to send it to us. And uh, as you know, that's not always something that people want to do. But so far, we've had about 1,000 send-in samples. We have 250 DZ twin pairs, about 160 MZ pairs, unrelated individuals. And these people are mostly middle-aged. They're average age of 64, and they're mostly women. And that's not because the twins in the cohort are mainly women. It's well, they are, actually. It's just that women seem to be more willing to be involved in this kind of study for whatever reason. Um, there's several ways that we can, we can uh, analyze data like this. So we've started with a 16S survey, for, and we have data for 1,000 samples now. And one thing that we can do is, when we have abundances of different taxa, we can look within twin pairs how well the abundances correlate. And if you you might expect a tighter correlation for twins that are MZ uh, for, for the abundances of taxa compared to DZ twins if there's a genotype effect. And we can calculate these correlation coefficients. And we can do that at every single node in the phylogenetic tree and then take a look at the distribution of the coefficients, the correlation coefficients. And what we see when we do this is that, um, this is a histogram, is that on, on average, the MZ twins tend to have stronger correlation coefficients than the DZ twins, which is shown here in the, the, the dark compared to the light. So that's telling us that there is a signal um, that the, the MZ that there is a genotype effect. We can do the same kind of analysis that I showed you from Pete Turnbaugh's paper, and we get the same result. So if we look generally across microbiotas using the Unifrac metric, we don't see a difference between MZ and DZs. But if we look within specific families, and these are the two dominant families of the firmicutes, which is the dominant uh, phylum in this, in this study, we do see that the MZs have a significantly uh, more similar microbiotas compared to their DZs, compared to DZs within, uh, within these particular families. Um, we can also use twin-based models to look at these kinds of data. So this is using the ACE model which is a, a, a twin-based a, a twin sort of statistical model that partitions uh, the variation in the data to genotype effects and environmental effects. And what we're showing here is the, is the effect of genotype or the heritability, and we're showing it as a, um, as a, a, a color. So the strength of the heritability is on this scale with warmer colors meaning stronger, and we've painted it onto parts of the phylogeny so that you can see that there's specific branches within the phylogeny that have particularly high heritability values. And again, they're within these two families, the Ruminococcaceae and the Lachnosphoraceae, such as this part in here. And there's other parts of the tree that have particularly cool colors, 
like the Bacteroidetes, and this is telling us that Bacteroidetes are particularly not heritable. So this is allowing us to zoom in on parts of the, the bacterial phylogeny that is most likely to be under host um, genetic control. And I just point out down here that we have methanogens, and they're also coming out as um, with some heritability, which is kind of interesting, and that corroborates what's been shown before with methanogens. Um, we can use these techniques and look across other previously published studies. So we pulled data from the Turnbow 2009 paper and a more recent paper from the Gordon Lab that also had some twins, and we do actually find some of the same patterns with these big families in the Firmicutes showing us some heritability and much less heritability in the Bacteroidetes shown there. And then, and I don't want you to write this down because this would probably uh, change because as you know, you know, a thousand samples in a GWAS study is still a very small GWAS study and, and we're in the middle of this, it'll, it'll expand over the next year or two. But using the data that we have, um, using the SNP data from the twins, we're able to run genome-wide association tests, and we, we're finding things like this, where, for example, eubacterium shown here um, is, has a correlation with uh, the genotype of a particular gene, so this particular SNP is coming up um, in association with, you, with a particular species of eubacterium here, and um, it, there is actually a risk allele for Crohn's in, um, in this gene. Uh, but, but again, it's early days, it's particularly underpowered at this point, and so um, it, we'll update, we'll be able to update this going forward. But in terms of gaps, uh, we still don't have an understanding of how the host genotype determines the microbiome, and we don't uh, know at this point how the microbiome interacts with host genotype to, to determine risk susceptibilities. But I think incorporating microbiome into GWAS studies for particular diseases is going to be very fruitful. We already know, for instance, that different kinds of Helicobacter pylori pose particular risks to particular kinds of, uh, uh, to people with particular genotypes, and so it, it, it would just makes intuitive sense that this is also going to be the case with microbiome. And at this point, it's, it's going to be interesting to find out how much variation in any kind of host trait could be explained by microbiota component alone or in combination with genotype. And, and I, I see this as, as I really look forward to seeing microbiome incorporated into all kinds of GWAS studies in the future, especially those that have some kind of inflammation basis that the microbiota might be driving. So now this kid wants his own personalized microbes, or at least he, he wants to be able to uh, determine, you know, the, the abundances of certain kinds of things that he might get colonized by. And what does he get? Well, there's some thought that he might be getting his mother's microbes at the very beginning, and, and uh, these are data that I think Maria uh, Dominguez Bello might talk about later on, that very early on we know that, that uh, it looks like microbiota come from the mother, and then other sources come in later. But I'm going to use this to segue into pregnancy because, and this, this nicely shows it, a, a pregnant woman who's just given birth is still not exactly like a pregnant woman, uh, a non-pregnant woman, and you can see this, like Kate, for example, would not have been looking like this a year ago. So pregnant, there's profound changes that happen during pregnancy and, and persist to a certain degree after pregnancy. And we were interested in those, and I'm going to talk about some work we've done on pregnancy now and the microbiota that are associated with pregnancy. Uh, we know that when women go from the first to the third trimester of pregnancy, several things happen. They gain adiposity, their blood glucose levels are higher, and their insulin sensitivity is decreased. And these are thought to uh, uh, help grow a baby by keeping the blood glucose levels higher, and then the increased adiposity is, is thought to help prepare for breastfeeding later. Uh, but these, these, these actually, these things, fat mass, blood glucose, insulin sensitivity, have also been shown to be regulated by microbes in non-pregnant animal models. So we were curious if microbiota had any role in this. So we worked with uh, Erika Alsulari and Seppo Salmanen from the University of Turku, who had ongoing studies with pregnant women, and 
They provided us with uh, stool samples and diet data and clinical data and, and baby stool samples from 91 women in Finland and uh, first and third trimester. And what we saw was uh, the first view of the data they got was this. So here are the same women sampled first and third trimester, and the first trimester samples are very similar to one another. And this, again, this is based on 16S. Uh, but the diversity increases, uh, expands quite dramatically in the third trimester. And the purple dots are postpartum, one month. So at this point, we didn't know what was normal, uh, the, the tight clustering or the not tight clustering. So we put it in the context of the human microbiome, male and female, obviously non-pregnant people here. And although there's a shift along this axis that might have to do with geography, because these are Finnish people, what, what we see is that this big expansion of beta diversity is really not, uh, really not normal. So we tried to associate the pattern with different things. We had obesity and overweight data uh, for, for prior to pregnancy, but that didn't explain the patterns, and neither did gestational diabetes status, because some of these women developed gestational diabetes. But, but this uh, didn't seem to map on to the expansion at all. What did, however, uh, seem to be driving these patterns were the, the gradients of how much of the bacteroidetes and, and proteobacteria were in these samples. So cool colors mean uh, less and warm colors mean more. So on this axis, we have uh, samples separating a, a, according to the bacteroides abundances and proteobacteria here, indicating that the third trimester had, uh, many of the samples had more proteobacteria present, and that was true for about 60% of the samples. So if we look a little uh, deeper and, and use uh, machine learning techniques to find the OTUs that can discriminate the two trimesters, we find that there's more short-chain fatty acid producers in the first trimester, which is kind of the normal-looking state. And the third trimester, we saw things that reminded us of opportunistic pathogens, things like proteobacteria, which seemed kind of odd, and they're the kinds of types of um, bacteria that are typically associated with inflammation. Um, we also noticed, noticed a drop-off in the alpha diversity, so the richness is reduced in the third trimester. So in other words, everybody has a reduction in the diversity, but all in their own way, because they become quite different from one another. And this persists um, one month postpartum, which is shown here. So this is another way of showing the clustering. Tight clustering is a shorter bar, and then you see the expansion of between subject diversity. It stays one month postpartum. And then when we looked in the kids, you see that higher uh, beta diversity in the children, and then by four years of age, they look like first trimester or normal people. Um, and I just note uh, on the side here that we couldn't actually match children to their mothers at any time points, even though the greater similarities between kids and their own mothers was for the four-year-olds in the first trimester, but we couldn't actually match the one month or the six months olds to their own mothers. They weren't more similar to their own mothers than to anybody else's mother. So we, we see this, this, this increase in proteobacteria, um, for instance, and other kinds of bacteria that don't look like they should be sort of in, you know, that dominant in a normal setting. And so we thought, is there inflammation? We'll look for it. And we measured greater levels of inflammatory cytokines in the third trimester stool, shown here, some of these like IL-6, TNF-alpha, and IFN-gamma. So then we thought, well, what happens? Uh, are the microbiota driving these, these phenotypes at all? So we took microbiota from the first and third trimester and, and transplanted them to germ-free animals. And what we found, and now these are data for the recipient mice, is that uh, we, after two weeks in the mice, you could see a difference between first and third trimester microbiota. And now looking at mouse cytokines, we saw that the third trimester microbiota uh, induced a higher cytokine load in the, so, so there was a sort of sign of inflammation in the third trimester recipients. We saw higher blood glucose in the third trimester recipient mice. And finally, we got fatter mice. Um, those that received the third trimester microbiota had greater adiposity gains after two weeks. And these were Swiss Websters, germ-free, sort of same genotype um, that we used for both 
obviously, for both uh, inocula here. So what we, what we think is happening from this study is that the first trimester has a relatively normal microbiota, and then as you go to third trimester, uh, there's an altered microbiota, and what might be driving this transition is something that we still have to determine. It might have to do with changes in immunity uh, that, that change uh, mucosal immunity. And when we transplant these microbiotas into germ-free animals, it's enough to see some of these phenotypic differences recapitulated in the, in the, uh, in the recipients here, so that we have a phatomyce with insulin des desensitization, which is actually what we see in the third trimester host when she's pregnant. So these metabolic changes that are um, induced by, by microbiota, it's something that we've seen that's been talked about in the context of uh, metabolic syndrome in human beings, and it's possible that, they have, that this kind of host microbiota interaction has maybe evolved in the context of pregnancy where it's really much more adaptive. And maybe microbiota kind of used as a link in the chain here so that when there's a change in hormones or immune state, that could alter the microbiota, and then the, the, the altered microbiota then has an effect on the host, but in this context, it's actually beneficial, as opposed to this other context where maybe it's less beneficial. <laughs> and so one of the things we're doing now is trying to compare, you know, do we see the same kind of host microbial interactions underlying these, um, these metabolisms and the metabolic inflammation that might be happening here? And it's intriguing to think of whether these kinds of host microbial interactions might have actually come out of the context of reproduction from an evolutionary standpoint. So I'm going to, this is my last slide, I'm going to finish with uh, what I think some of the big knowns and unknowns are, and um, where I think there's, there's so, so areas that, that might be, be very interesting to go into, and that's thinking about what the um, extent uh, to what extent do microbiota affect host phenotype? So we know from these germ-free studies, for instance, with transplantation that have been done in various labs and pioneered by the Gordon Lab, that microbiota can affect metabolism, immunity, there's, there's work coming out showing that microbiota can affect behavior, but there's many, many other things that we haven't actually looked at yet, such as aspects of fertility, uh, aspects of longevity, how, how much activity animals or people engage in, um, basic physiology. Uh, there's a lot more to look at the extent to which microbes can do this, how they do this, and what kinds of microbes do this, and, 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 and how much can you push it. So, and this is a, a picture that was stolen from uh, Garland's lab at UCR where they've been selecting for mice, say, that enjoy running a lot. But I think that we could do these kinds of studies where we select for microbes that confer these kinds of behaviors. And it, it's going to be very interesting to see going forward just how much microbes influence phenotype. And then I think we can use that as a basis uh, for therapeutics uh, later. So I'd like to finish up by thanking the people in my group, specifically uh, Armie Corrin, who worked on the pregnancy study, and Julia Goodrich, who's been working on the Twins UK study. Um, I have a number of collaborators, this is just some of them including Tim Spector and Andy Clark, um, who work with me on the, uh, on, the GWAS, um, on the GWAS study, and Erica and Seppo, who worked with us, and were very generous with the uh, pregnancy study that I mentioned, and we have some other th ongoing things. But finally, I'd like to thank, uh, from MIH, the new Innovator Award, which has really allowed me to do creative things and not worry about it. Um, this is a fantastic program. And then uh, Bob Carp and IDDK for funding our Twins UK study. And thank you. Okay, if somebody, we have time for one quick question, especially if you're standing near a microphone. And also, as uh, the questionnaire is going there, remember, especially people online, that the email address is hmvision at mail.nih.gov. So with respect to one of your earlier slides saying that nobody's been followed from birth to old age. Am I wrong? No, 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 oh, not okay. at all. <laughs> no, but, but I mean, a cesarean versus natural birth is something that everybody remembers, and it's a relatively mm -hmm. easy thing you could correlate at 
later age. Has anybody done those studies? Well, that's interesting. With our twins, we've, a- we've been uh, asking them, were you born by C-section and were you born uh, vaginally? And funnily enough, not everybody remembers or, <laughs> or knows, but we're trying to use, use this cohort because, because we can ask them all sorts of things. Uh, that's something that we're, d- we're trying to do. Okay, let's okay. thank Thanks. Ruth again. Let's thank Ruth again. Thanks, Ruth. Okay, our next talk is uh, Jacques Revelle, uh, Microbiome Dynamics in Adults, and here's Jacques.